Ephesians chapter 4, starting in verse 1. We're going to continue a series we started last week. Uh, That series is the characteristics of a grown-up church. And uh, I'm going to read through Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 16, and then we'll we'll have a little bit of review, uh, and then we'll dive into the remaining three characteristics of a grown-up church. When you're with me at Ephesians chapter 4, say amen. Okay. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. Paul is not above begging them. He's, he's asking them with, with fervency and uh, some passion behind it. With all lowliness of mind, or rather with all lowliness and meekness, with long-suffering, forbearing one another in love. Uh, remember, long-suffering is fortitude. It is with long or enduring temper. Uh, it is leniently or patiently. Forbearing is to hold oneself up against, that is, to put up with. I am thankful that you forbear me. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. To endeavor is to use speed, to make effort, to be prompt or earnest, to be diligent. Unity does not happen by accident. It happens with intentionality. It happens when people endeavor, make effort, be earnest, and be diligent to maintain unity, to keep unity. There is one body and one spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. I'm thankful for the truth that there is but One Lord, and his name is Jesus. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive, gave gifts unto men. Let's go ahead and skip down to verse 11. It says, he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers... For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. As uh, a way of review, uh, and for anybody that maybe wasn't here last Sunday morning, uh, the, the saints are the ones that are being grown for the work of the ministry. And when saints are grown, they will edify or build up the body of Christ. Till we all come, verse 13, in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. God's desire is for every single person under the sound of my voice to come into the fullness of the measure of the stature of Christ. That's what he wants for you. That we henceforth be no more children. Go ahead and poke your neighbor, tell him to grow up. (laughs) That we be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things which is the head, even Christ. We are growing up But not growing up to be wise to this world. We're growing up into him in all things. I want to grow to be more like Jesus Christ and he is the head. From whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth. According to the effectual working in the measure of every part maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. The body has an amazing ability through the grace that is given unto every member to edify itself. The body has the ability to repair, 
to build up, to strengthen itself. In the natural, we call this an immune system. And everybody's immune system is working in overtime. In the spiritual, we can see this as every joint supplying that which is needed. And the body edifies itself in love. All right. Okay, so the three characteristics we talked about last week. The first one was there is a diligent pursuit of unity. That is a marker of a grown-up church. A grown-up church is not dependent upon the number of people that are in the seats. It is not dependent on how long a church has been established. It is dependent upon the level of maturity that, that make or that the body makes up. The individual members of the body and their level of maturity. Again, unity is not automatic. By the way, if you want to keep the unity in this place today, uh, then I've got news for you. You must come with expectation. If you desire to be united with the body, you must come with an expectation and a desire for God to move. Because I refuse to step backward to a lackadaisical attitude. And so if I'm all by myself, unity is broken. But if we make up in our minds together that God is going to have his way in this house, we can maintain the unity of the Spirit. I, I have come today with an expectation that God wants to demonstrate his power, that there is going to be a mighty move of God. And so just... Just as a side note, if you're interested in maintaining a spirit of unity in the bond of peace, I expect you then to step up to that level because I, and I know that there are others, refuse to slide down to a lower level. Number two, the fivefold ministry is active. Again, this is not my church. This is not any one person's church. This is God's church. And God placed teachers and prophets and apostles and evangelists and pastors in his church because it would be dangerous for one man to attempt to perpetually fill all these roles in a local body. I thank God that we have been blessed with apostles and evangelists and prophets and teachers that minister to this church. I thank God that it does not all rest on my shoulders. Number three, uh, a characteristic of a grown-up church is that they are doctrinally solid. It was pretty windy this week, and I got the mail. And uh, as I was closing the mailbox, I turned to walk towards the front door of the church, and a gust of wind came and blew a postcard out, or actually two of them, out of my hand. Have you ever done that, Chase? Where you're going after it, you're like, you're, you're doing this, and you're wondering if anybody's watching. And so I, I got to the first one, and I put my foot on it, and I was able to pick it up, and it was a postcard addressed to Mark Brown. I'm like, okay, whew, I got Bishop's Mail. Uh, and I, I knew who the other one was addressed to. It was addressed to Jordan Brown. And I'm like, this is important. I got to get this. It wasn't important. It was junk mail. I just don't like to litter. And... I got to get this. And so I'm following it. But every time I get close to it, wind blows it another 10 feet away. And at one point, I even am bending down to get it, and the wind blows it. And eventually, I, I gave up, okay? When I was over by the basketball hoop, I gave up. It was just pff, gone. So sorry, Jordan Brown, you didn't get your mail. But that's what a non-grown-up church looks like. When you're not grounded in the word of God, when your feet haven't found an anchor point, when you haven't settled long ago that there is only one Lord, one faith, one baptism, you'll be blown about by every wind of doctrine. You'll be blown about by every cultural change. But a grown-up church has already made up in their mind, this is what we're going to stand on. We're going to stand on the unchanging word of God. It, it doesn't matter how hard the wind is blowing. And culture has a pendulum. Even culture within the Pentecostal movement has a pendulum. Right now, there's a very strong pendulum swing towards the fivefold ministry. 
A generation ago, there was a very strong pendulum swing away from the fivefold ministry or the operation of the gifts of the Spirit. But a grown up church is going to stand firmly, rightly dividing the Word of God and walking in truth, regardless of which way political or societal winds are blowing. Amen. All right. And of course, nobody's shouting or anything because that's all review, but we're ready for new material now. Okay. In a grown up church, truth and love have found a balance. Verse 15 says this but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Some pride themselves on being truth tellers, but love is totally absent. You ever been around one of those people? Bless God, they're going to speak the truth. They have zero tact. Often they have zero anointing. But they're going to speak truth, whether you like it or not. Okay, that's out of balance. That's out of order. But then on the other side of the pendulum swing, since we're going with that illustration today, there are those who just pride themselves in love. I love, I love, I love. But forget that true love will tell the truth even when it hurts. True love speaks truth, but does it in meekness and does it in gentleness and does it with a right spirit and a right attitude. And a grown-up church is made up of mature saints of God that are able not only to hear the truth in love, but to speak the truth in love. The writer of Hebrews says this in Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 11. There is much more that I would like to say about this, but it is difficult to explain, especially since you are spiritually dull and don't seem to listen. Now, this is not me talking to you. This is the writer. I believe it's Paul talking to a body of believers. But he says this, you have been believers so long now that you ought to be teaching others Instead, you need someone to teach you again the basic things about God's Word. You are like babies who need milk and cannot eat solid food. What a horrific life that would be. Anybody like steak? Now we got, okay, all right, we found some common ground today. I have in the fridge right now, thawing out, a 12-ounce, grass-fed, dry-aged, prime-grade Denver steak that I'm going to cook up today, and I'm going to eat it, I think. My kids are probably going to mob me, my daughters anyway. Y'all pray for my son. It would be foolishness for me to go home and require a glass of milk instead of a steak. God put teeth in my mouth for a reason. It is so that I can chew on some things that are a little bit more challenging. You can't swallow steak like you swallow milk. But I enjoy a steak a lot more than I enjoy a glass of milk. Now, steak and milk together, we could, we could start moving ahead on this. Maybe some cheese. But Paul's saying, look, at some point along the line, you've got to grow. You've got to mature. And he had, he had a desire to continue to teach this church, but they were not ready to move off of the milk and to begin to eat solid food. He says in verse 14, solid food is for those who are mature, who through training have the skill to recognize the difference between right and wrong. It does not happen automatically. And it's getting worse in our culture. Our culture is becoming 
more and more immature and less and less capable of receiving hard truths that might sting a little bit, but that would be given to edify and to grow and to bless others. At the same time, our culture is also losing any semblance of love and compassion one for another. And so there's, 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 you know, we, they, derisively call one group a snowflake and we der- and then we exalt this other group as those who speak the truth but somewhere in the middle there should be a love that is able to flow out of you to begin to minister to somebody even hard truths that they need to hear Paul writes to his son in the gospel, Timothy, and he says this in 2 Timothy, and the servant of the Lord must not strive. Anybody in here a servant of the Lord? You must not strive. You are not called to get into arguments. You are not called to get into shouting matches. You are not called to be a jerk. In fact, I would avoid politics with a 10-foot pole if I were you because you're likely, you have a 50% chance of severing your hope of influencing somebody with the gospel if you're going to strive for this person, that person, this platform, or that platform. Now, there are, I'm not saying that there aren't some things that are worth arguing in favor of or debating in favor of, but you better stand on the word of God and you better have a spirit of love. There are topics like abortion that the church can never back down on. Abortion was wrong. It will be wrong. It doesn't matter what age that child is uh, because from the moment of conception, from the very moment that a baby was conceived, God said, "I before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. But the church can't just stand there and ch- thump our chest and declare, well, bless God, you're wrong. No, there's got to be an attitude of love. There's got to be an ability to speak truth in love he says the servant of the lord must not strive but be gentle unto all men apt to teach patient in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves if god by chance peradventure would give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth I'm always a little bit cautious around somebody who delights in rebuking. The servant of the Lord is called to be gentle and is called to be meek and is called to be patient. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for correction, for reproof, and for instruction in righteousness. I can't rebuke my children on something I've never taught them. That would not be fair to my child. To to provide any level of physical discipline on something they've never been taught is unfair. And so first, teaching must occur. My willingness to receive teaching alters what comes next. If I am taught up, and I move forward, there can be some instruction in righteousness. There can be correction that's given. Rebuke ought to be a last resort. A grown-up church communicates, we're still on on, uh, point four here, truth and love have found a balance, but a a grown-up church communicates with each other like grown-ups. There is no place for gossip or slander in a grown-up church. The saints don't tear down the ministry behind closed doors. And the ministry doesn't tear down the saints behind closed doors. Because both can occur and both are equally wrong. It is not healthy, it is not fitting for anybody to be talking about anybody behind closed doors. But conflicts in a grown-up church are resolved biblically. I go to the one whom I'm offended by. Or I go to the one whom I've offended. If it comes to your mind that you might have offended somebody, do not wait for them to come to you. It came to your mind, even if there's a chance, you think, huh, did I I offend so-and-so? Ah, they got to grow up. 
That is not the biblical response. The biblical response is for you to go to them and to say, I'm sorry if I offended you. That was not my intention. Well, bless God. Now, if you're offended, your option is not to sit back and wait for, oh, they know what they did. Listen, if I offended you, it's not likely that I know what I did. I'm dumber than a box of hair. I need you to come to me and tell me what I've done. Because I promise you at some point I will offend you. God's still working on me. I'm trying to grow. I'm trying to grow up into the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ and communicate the truth in love. But if I've offended you, you can't sit back and have a bitter attitude and a bitter spirit. Not if we want to be a united church and a grown-up church. A grown-up church knows how to resolve conflict biblically. There are not simmering tensions between pulpit and pew and pew and pulpit. There's nobody in the room that you have an unresolved conflict with if we're a grown-up church. If there is somebody that you've got a conflict with or that you can't have open communication with, then you ought to rectify that between services so we don't carry that into an 11 o'clock service where we're expecting God to move. Why would we expect God to move powerfully if we can't even cross an aisle in love and ask a neighbor for forgiveness? No, a grown-up church understands the power of forgiveness. A grown-up church knows how in meekness and humility to swallow pride and go to my brother or go to my sister and ask forgiveness of them. Well, we're not shouting, but maybe we ought to be. Mutual submission ensures teachability and receptivity. You cannot be taught by somebody that you're not submitted to. You can hear the words, but you cannot be taught. No one in this building, ministry or not, is perfect. No one. And so at some point, somebody is going to offend you. And we live in a dangerous culture that allows for it, and we've even come up with a term for it. You ready? Church hurt. Anybody ever been church hurt? Don't don't lift your hands, okay? That's not to devalue or to minimize it. Hurtful things have happened in the body of Christ because nobody here is perfect. Everybody here is human. But someday we will in fact be perfect in that measure of the stature or the fullness of Jesus Christ. Until then, you've got to recognize that the person across the aisle that hurt you is just as much of a jerk as you are. Because you're not perfect either. That's what church hurt often forgets. Anybody ever been offended at work? You raise your hands on that one. We don't have a term called work hurt. I don't quit my I don't rage quit my job and never get another job because I'm work hurt. What about anybody ever have a teacher offend you in school? I did. I offended a lot of teachers in school too, by the way. My teachers, y'all pray for them. See, a, a grown up doesn't quit school and call it school hurt and avoid a school building for the rest of their life. But for some reason, our culture has allowed church hurt. This is, I'm not even anywhere near my notes right now, but we're just going to plow ahead in the Holy Ghost. Uh, our culture has allowed this term called church hurt. Listen, I'm sorry if somebody hurt you. If it was me, I'd doubly apologize. If you've been holding on to it and I'm unaware of it, I need you to come to me so that we can, we can fix this. We're going to cry together. We're going to forgive one another. If it's going to come to my mind, I will come to you. I promise. If I offend you and I, I'm cognizant of it, I I will come to you. Why? Because there is a truth that needs to be communicated inside the church and outside the church. And a grown-up church can speak the truth in love. But the ultimate reality of it is, is there, there are some things that ministry has wanted to say but holds back.
that's not a rebuke. But like the writer of Hebrews saying, look, there's more I want to say, but you don't seem ready to listen. A painful area of ministry, if I could be transparent with you right now, is when somebody takes the posture of just closing their ears to any sort of instruction. And it guarantees that their growth and maturity stops at that point. You will not grow if you cannot be taught. Now, my job and ministry's job, the fivefold ministry's calling is there, there are some things that have to be communicated, period. If, if I see somebody sprinting their way into hell, I have to speak regardless of whether they're able to receive it or not. That's not what I'm talking about here. The, the gospel will be taught. That will be preached. That will be communicated. But continued growth and maturity becomes a choice, and it becomes, am I receptive? If nobody's ever allowed to tell you something that stings, or if all of a the sudden there's a moment of correction and then you, you don't answer a text or a call or show up to church for three weeks, that's not maturity. And there's growing that needs to be done. Are we doing all right still? All right. I'll be completely transparent with you. This still happens in my life. Rebuke, correction, instruction. And it's incredibly helpful. And at some moments is incredibly painful and uncomfortable. It's like surgery without anesthesia. I, if you want. If you want to know. Now, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying that I'm withholding information from anybody. And, and, and m for the record, I mean, really, most don't even... I'll tell you what you need to hear. But if you're curious, ask me. If you're ready to hear it, I just might tell you. If you're curious, ask Bishop. Ask him. Do you see anything in my life that's stopping growth? And receive it in love. Amen. Let's move on to something a little bit more exciting. Number five, in a grown-up church, Jesus Christ is Lord. Verse 13 said, till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Verse 15 said, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. He is the standard to which we are striving. The head, of course, speaks to his authority. If there is one body, that necessitates that there is one head. Okay? There are examples of humans living with more than one head, but we separate them into more than one person, even if the rest of their body is shared. Why? Because the head is the leader. The head is the, the thing that drives, that speaks. And everyone here today is thankful that your head is in charge of your body. The head sitting on, and everybody here has a head. Well, glory. And your head is in charge of your body. It is. And you're not even cognizant of the fact most of the time that the head is, oh man, if, if we had to think about everything that our brain does, we would never even be able to get out of bed. Devin, stand up for a second. Rub your tummy and pat your head. That requires thinking, okay? But walk over to that wall. There is no thought put into that. Not, not with any sort of, of, of apparent effort. Because his 
head takes care of that with him not having to put any thought into that. The head has solved that long ago. How many things does our head do for us that we don't ever even realize or have to think about? You haven't even thought about breathing, unless you're coughing, in the last 30 minutes. Your head is just taking care of that for you. You haven't even had to think about digestion at all in these 30 minutes. The head is innervating and driving all of that for you. There's great benefit when you put somebody in the head position and make them the Lord and the King of your life because there are many functions and many things that they'll take care of that you never even have to consider, you never even have to think of. All you've got to do is allow the head to be the head and be in the place of position and authority and control of your life. And if you'll allow the head to be the head and communicate in love to the rest of the body the head will take care of the functions of daily life without you ever even having to consider what's going on that's the blessing of allowing Jesus Christ to be the head, the Lord, the king of your life. There are kingly concerns uh, that too many people want to carry on their shoulders. Uh, but Jesus said, why don't you bring those to me? Make me your head and I'll put a light yoke on you. I'll put a light burden on you. Uh, if you're weary and if you're tired, uh, it just might be because you're desperately clinging to control of some areas of your your life that your head is supposed to be taken care of. Jesus would walk into a room. He would walk into a room after his resurrection and he would show Thomas in John chapter 20 and verse 28. He would show Thomas his spear hole in his side. He would show Thomas the, the, the nail prints in his hands. And he would allow Thomas to touch him and to handle him and to look at him. And Thomas makes this confession of Jesus Christ. This is a powerful confession that Thomas makes. Why? Because he is a devout, monotheistic Jew. He has been raised his entire life believing that there's only one God. Uh, and they, they, they called him by the name Yahweh or Jehovah. He has been raised his entire life believing this and practicing this, but when he beholds Jesus and he looks at the spear hole and the nail prints in his hands and in his feet, Thomas makes this confession. You are my Lord and my God. You're my Lord. You're the supreme being in authority, not just over the universe, but he said, you're my Lord, uh, it's one thing for you to confess Jesus as Lord of the universe, but it's another thing for you to confess him as Lord of your life. Uh, he must be the Lord of your life. He must be the head of your life. Otherwise, you're out of order. And your body's doing whatever it wants to do, but there's a head that's trying to send signals and direction and communicate with the body. When you come into alignment, you're going to be able to walk in the spirit. When you come into alignment, you're going to be able to do the kingdom tasks that he desires you to do. If, if, if whatever part of the body you are is disconnected from the head, your function is lost. If we as a church decide in unity we're going to sever ourselves from the head. The body dies. It loses its function. Far too many today want Jesus as their Savior but refuse him as their Lord. We want to just come into the house of God and, and say, God, forgive me for my addiction. Free me from my sins. And we want to rejoice in the fact that we've been set free from sin and the punishment and the penalty of sin has been removed off of our life. But then I want the freedom to go do whatever I want. But like Thomas, we've got to come to a place as a grown-up church uh, where we can truthfully declare, Jesus, you are my Lord and you're my God. Uh, you're not just my Savior. You're not just my provider. You're not just the healer I call on when I'm sick. Uh, you're not just the one I call on when I need to feel a little emotion. Uh, you're not just that to me, God. You're my Lord. Uh, you're my King. Uh, you're my God. Uh, you are the 
head of my life. You are the authority I look to in my life. A grown-up church has set Jesus in his rightful position as the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. That means a grown-up church is going to consult with the head for direction in their daily life. They're not going to walk free from the direction of the head. They're not going to do things as a body outside of the direction of the head. They're not going to begin to act in ways or speak in ways that the head does not direct them to speak. Someday every knee will bow. And every tongue will declare that Jesus Christ is King of kings and Lord of lords. My question for Jesus, church, my question for you then is, is he supreme in your life? Do you consult his will? Do you hunger after his word? Do you thirst after his commandments? This hand is waiting for this head to tell it what to do. Are you waiting for him to tell you what to do? Or are you acting on your own accord? Do you look to him for provision and sustenance? By the way, that is one of the responsibilities of Lord. To provide for their subjects. It is the king's responsibility to ensure the welfare of his kingdom. You're worried about finances... But you've got a head that'll take care of finances. If you'll step under his lordship, he'll provide for you. Or do we just visit on the occasional Sunday? He's the head. He gives direction. We're growing up into him. And finally, the sixth characteristic of a grown-up church, and we could probably keep going on this, but we're going to stop here. Every joint supplies. In any church, there is going to be varying members or varying levels of spiritual maturity because there are people at varying places in their walk with God. That doesn't mean that if we have a newborn baby, the church is suddenly no longer mature. But what we're talking about here is the ability to mature and a pursuit of maturity. The members of the body are helped by the fivefold ministry to discover and grow in their giftings and talents. If you're the same three years from now as you are right now, something wrong has happened. There has to be growth, there has to be maturing, there has to be a, a forward progress in our lives. Every joint supplies. There are spirit or service gifts. Romans chapter 12 would be a great example of these. For the sake of time, we're going to move through them very quickly. But there are gifts like ministry, like prophecy, like giving, encouragement. Did you know giving is a gifting? And there are people in this room that have the gift of giving. And they do it with singleness of heart. And you'll never even know about them. They've found their gifting and they've matured in it. Spiritual gifts are present and in operation from varied members of the body. I want this to be interpreted carefully. I'm so thankful for every tongue and interpretation and every word that we've received. But it is a hunger of mine to see more gifts from more people. More gifts from more people. Don't ever make the mistake of thinking that just because somebody operates in a gift of the Spirit that somehow they're far more spiritually mature than you are. All it means is that they've learned to yield in that area of their life to the direction of the head. Every joint supplies. 20% aren't doing 80% of the work, but there is a shared workload. I'm thankful for a church with a shared workload. I'm thankful for a church where uh, really on, on a moment's notice I could assemble a group of guys to fix something or we could get together a group of ladies to cook meals or to, to clean or, and, or even better, pray. It, it's easy 
to send a few text messages and find somebody to pray with. Woo. We could stay there for a moment. If you've never sent somebody or called somebody and said, hey, we should get together and pray, you're missing out on an opportunity to connect with the body. Every joint supplies fellowship and encouragement. Please do not let this be the only time that you see the people that you are connected in this body. Do not, do not let this be the only time that you see me or see the person sitting across from you on a Sunday between 10 and 1. If that's the only time you're reaching out to somebody, if that's the only time you're fellowshipping, there's an area of growth that we can mature in. And finally, as we all stand together, there's an expectation of involvement. This is not, nor can we ever allow it to become a church where there is a separation between pulpit and pew. I am blessed to be able to be full focus here at this church because of people that have a service gift of giving and do so cheerfully. But there is not clergy and laity. Everybody in this room is called to minister. Everybody's called to teach Bible studies. Everybody is called to spread this gospel. And we're going to do it together together. There's an expectation of involvement. If I'm bugging you about involvement, it's because there's something that you can supply to the body that we're lacking, and we need you to come alongside and be involved. Don't wait for somebody else to do it. Amen. Amen. Our goal, our passion, our desire is that we would grow up to be like Jesus. I pray that you understand that there's not an angry thought in my heart right now. There's a passion, however, for us to grow up and to be mature, responsible, forward-moving saints of God so that the kingdom can grow and so that the work of the kingdom can be done. It would be a tragedy if this room were filled with 200 little babies. It'd be loud. It'd be stinky. And it would be unhealthy because who's going to care for 200 babies? So it's time for each and every one of us to grow up to the point where you can care for a newborn baby and bring them forward and see them grow. Wouldn't you love to be a spiritual grandparent? I can't wait to be a grandparent. I'm told it's better than parenting. Parenting's pretty fun. But it's no different in the spiritual realm. You get to raise up kids, and then you get to watch your kids go out and teach Bible studies and raise up disciples. That's the most rewarding thing ever. Or you could come to church and suck your thumb on Sunday. And decide, I'm just going to stay a baby. No way. <laughs>